השם, זה ממורי אוף חכם, אהרון בן לאה, אסתר בת לטיפה, רפאל, רחל בת שרה, שלמה בן לינדה שפטי, and also also, לעילוי נשמת פרץ יהודה בן מנחם מנדל, זונטג, it's his your site now, and רפואת, להבדיל, לרפואת אמה בת דבורה איסקוב, and לעילוי נשמת סופיה סוניה בת שרה. ברוך השם. טוב, tonight's topic, at least put phones on, off. Tonight's topic, uh, I was asked to speak about the Nisyonot, the test that we have in life. It looks today that the, the amount of test we have is more than the average, or maybe more than ever. With what's, with, with what's going on in the last uh, year. So before we start, today I heard a very, very disturbing news. Very disturbing news from Israel. You know now about five million Israelis already got the vaccines and the numbers started to come down. And Bibi with his pride and ego already met the leaders of the world today and said, forget Corona, Corona is behind us. An hour later, they published that in, in a nursery, in an old nursing home, nursing home, For the old people, 12 of, all of them got vaccinated with the two shots, 12 of, 12 of them got corona in one place. Do you understand what it means? It means that what I said a month ago unfortunately happened. A month ago I said that all these people with their arrogance and ego that speaks against the vaccine, I'm not getting it, they, they speak against Gdolei Israel. So about a third of the people in Israel, 30% at least, did not want to get the shot. As results of that, they develop a new mutation. And finally, unfortunately, this mutation probably, the vaccine does not kill it. That means we are back to square one. Everything begins all over now. All the vaccines, everything was all for nothing. Why? Because stubborn fools among us will kill all of us in the end. And one professor, when I speak, I don't bring it for myself. Either I follow the biggest doctors that understand what they talk about, or the biggest chachamim, depending on the topic. One big professor, Israeli genius professor, that I've been following him, I know that he knows everything he talks about. He said, if the people will continue to refuse to get vaccinated, the next mutation, there's no guarantee that the vaccines will be able to handle it. And if they will develop a new mutation and the vaccine will not be able to handle it, we will go back to the beginning of everything. Again, lockdown, again, shut the airport, again, shut all the schools, back to square one. I don't know for sure yet that these 12 people, all of them got a new mutation, but I have common sense. It cannot be that in a place of 40 old people, 12 of them will, will get corona after all 40 got vaccinated. 12 out of 40, it's, it's like 30%. And uh, Pfizer and Moderna, they say that the vaccine cover 95% and it's been tested for the last month, month and a half in Israel. And they actually even had a little bit better than 95%. So, they, and, and they can't lie. You know, these companies, they can't lie because there is, there is, they check what they say. If you say 95%, they come and they check. And for instance, Johnson and Johnson, they develop a vaccine that is an old fashioned one, not with the new technology. The way we used, it used to be, they take a vaccine, make it weak, injected into the body, there's always a risk here that it can develop into corona, even though it's weak. But the body is supposed to overcome this weak vaccine, but it's only 66%. Everything I recommended the vaccines is not about Johnson and Johnson. It's only Pfizer and Moderna. Make it clear to people not to make a mistake. 
Why? Because Pfizer and Corona have no risk whatsoever about them. Nothing. It's only injecting spikes to the body, no virus, no nothing. Johnson and Johnson is a whole different world. Whatever, we have to investigate, to check what's their numbers, we don't know. But it's only 66% either way. Even if it's safe, even if I come and say to you in two weeks from now, don't worry, it's safe, nobody will die from it, no, nothing will happen. It's, but it's only protecting 66%. And if what I think now, there's a new mutation that the vaccine does not know how to handle, that means we're probably going to stay with this corona forever. Because there's, there's already mutation from South Africa, mutation from England, mutation from New York, and mutation from another place. And if today what I say now it's going to be verified, there's going to be five mutations already in a month and a half. That means every week a new virus is developed. Now you have to see how Hashem made the world. It's unbelievable. If you know a little bit about viruses, it's just that alone should make you a Baal Tshuva, but fanatic. By the way, it's, it's not an exaggeration because Professor Rubinstein from Einstein Hospital in Bronx, he was a big professor, doctor for HIV, for AIDS, He's the head of the, the, the department of blood sicknesses in Einstein Hospital. And he became a Baal Tshuva through his research about HIV and AIDS. He saw how the virus behave. He said something like this definitely has a hand that maneuver everything. It cannot be random. It's, it, it reacts mamash like a human being. He knows how to hide, he keeps changing into a different mutation. That's what got him to start asking questions about the creator of the world until he became religious, had seven kids, moved to Monsi. He's a real big shot, one of the biggest doctors in the, wo in the world. The way the viruses work, Hashem made these viruses, they are mic microscopic, nobody can see them, uh, definitely not in the air. And not only that, they do not have their life of their own. They can't survive on their own. They don't have their own life. It's like a baby in his mother womb. Once the baby is in, he doesn't have his own life without the cord. He breathes, he eats everything from the cord. If the cord gets cut, the baby is finished. <coughs> Even when the baby comes out, if you don't cut the cord, he doesn't get oxygen from the air yet. Only after you cut it and you hit him on the back, <coughs> I begin to cry and he begins to connect to our environment, it's unbelievable. But not only that, this virus, in order for the virus to survive, it penetrates into the cell. A cell inside this chromosome, it cannot be on top of the cell, it will not survive. It needs to penetrate and suck from inside. That's why Hashem made this virus, those spikes, like a needle, like a sword. They slowly, slowly penetrate the, 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 the shell, they go inside, they sit inside, and they kill you from inside. That's what happened. Some of them are more fatal than the other, as we know. The flu, now it's corona, is worse. There's AIDS virus and other things that are worse than that. So the way they did it, they, they just took the spikes. Genius idea. Whoever thought about it, simple, simple but genius. They only cut the spikes out of the virus, injected it into the body without the virus. The virus that go inside and kill you was not injected into the body, just the spikes. The body, the way Hashem made the body, the body can create antibody to anything. Anything you inject into the system, the body by itself create yesh me'ayin from nothing. There's nothing in the world that was created yesh me'ayin besides what Hashem did. Whatever we create, we take a rock, we create from it something. We take wood, we create furniture. We take plastic, we create tables from that. We have raw material and we create from that whatever we want. But this is all existing raw material in nature. Here the body creates from nothing a negative antibody against what actually invaded your body. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Whatever the body sees, oh, there is invasion. 
somebody, something, somebody attack you. You know, we have in our computer, we have in our computer viruses, right? Sometimes you get a virus, so you have antivirus software. Imagine if you had a computer that no matter what virus goes in, without any software, the computer by itself will know to create the exact antibody against that virus. No matter what kind of virus you will invent. Anything you will invent that never existed before goes into the computer, the next day the computer knows how to create the, the, the opposite, kill it, and computer like this will be a, a revolution in the world. That's, that's basically what's happening. So Hashem gave the virus a very, very serious weapon that the virus knows how to change itself. When the virus sees that the body is attacking him in shape A, he switched to B. When the body develops weapon against B, he changed to C. When the body develops weapon against C, it will change to D. It will never end. When will it end? That all the people in the world will get, all the people in the country will get a vaccine, kill A completely. There's no more A. Nobody will pass it to each other. It will never switch to, to B because all the A was killed. That's the problem. See, simple math. But because we have wicked people among us and a lot of ignorant people and people that their Torah is YouTube conspiracy morons theory that they listen all day on, this, on these computers, because of that, they're going to bring chas v'shalom a destruction on us. If not physical destruction, they will bring a financial destruction which already happening. And if not financial destruction, they'll bring a spiritual dis destruction. Because if the yeshivot will be closed again now, there is thousands of kids in Israel went off the derech. That's it. No Shabbat, no Torah, no nothing, cut the peot, walking in the street, Shabbat nikim, what they call, just because of the situation with this corona. Remember, Israel is not New York. In New York, Baruch Hashem, at least half of the people live in private homes. Private homes, it's coming here. We go, Monsey, Lakewood, anywhere, New Jersey, Long Island, Brooklyn, Queens. It's a lot of private homes. It's not like that in Israel. Most people live in small, tiny apartments in Israel. You have seven, eight, nine kids. You live in a two-bedroom apartment in Bnei Brak. Your kids don't go to school for four or five months. And they don't have any social media and no computer and nothing to do all day in the house. Nothing to do. You can't let them walk in the street, neighbor, cars, dangerous, little kids. So you're stuck with them four or five months in the house. Imagine what happened. That's it. They run away. They run to the street. Who knows where they go? They meet people. <sighs> Why did Hashem do this to us? It's a big mystery. Why? I'll tell you why. There are two kinds of suffering in life. There is suffering that it's a punishment for our sins. That's the concept of the Torah. Hashem reward the righteous and punish the wicked. Every second, every day, all the time, all over the world. Jews and non-Jews. The righteous and the wicked get what they deserve. So the Gemara says, any surim below avon. Suffering don't come for nothing. If it comes, it comes as results of, of your actions. It's the consequences of your action. There is another term. It's called yisurim shel ahava. Suffering out of love. It sounds a little bit tricky. What, Hashem Chas Shalom is sadistic? He enjoyed to torture us? What does it mean? Imagine someone come to his son, Moishi, come here. Turn his ear like this. Ah, he screams. Ah, 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 pull his hair. What are you doing? I love you so much. I want to show you how much I love you. Give you punches, twist your ear, pull your hair. If somebody would see that, they would say, well, what can this father needs evaluation? Something is not normal, right? That's what it sounds like. Why are you giving him punches? Because I love him so much. It's love patch. You know this term? There is such thing, by the way. Kissing you, it's already boring. You got to give him a smack. Ravavadia is to give smack to people he loves. You saw how many smacks? People will ho would read Tehillim before they go to Rav Ovadia that they'll get a lot of them and hard ones. 
because those he only liked a little bit, he gave one or two. Those he was really impressed by, pa, 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 and pulled him, when the guy went by, pull him, boom, give him another one. Well, that was his way to show love. No, I said it. The question is, when Hashem gives a person his surim shel ava, that means this person is not guilty of anything. It's completely tzaddik. See, it's learn, keep mitzvot, good midot, no lashon nara, watch his eyes, watch his ear, baal chesed. Everybody loves him. Big chacham, big tzaddik. What's to say bad about him? It's perfect. All of a sudden you hear he has uh, chemo, he has this, he has a financial problem, has to show him something with the kid, and you begin to ask question, where is the justice? Why such a tzaddik has to suffer? I can't believe this. Look at that one, look at this one. How, how can it be? Everything looks the opposite of, of, what, of justice. The concept of Yisurim Shel Ahavaha is one, how do you know if the suffering that Hashem gave you is suffering out of punishment or suffering out of love? The answer is, when Hashem give you suffering out of love, what's the purpose of those Yisurim? Why they enjoy to torture people? Obviously not. Because we know the concept of Mekor Atov Retzono Le'ativ. First page in Mesilat Yisharim. Hashem is the source of good. And his will is to benefit others. Somebody that created the world and created people in one purpose to benefit them, obviously does not sit here and think how to torture them. So if you actually get Isurim Shel Ahava, suffering of love, how do you know if the suffering you got is because of your sins or because Hashem wants to triple your reward? The concept of Yisurim Shel Ava is to take someone that Hashem owes him a million rewards, giving him some suffering for a month or two, and triple it to three million. Why? He doesn't complain, he accepts it, I deserve it. They ask Chacham Ben Zion Abba Shaul. The closest thing to perfect in a human being that you could have found is he was him. They ask him, Rabbi, why, why you... I heard you from outside, you scream from pain. Why you, why you deserve to get such suffering? He said, he looked at him, so what kind of a question is this? What do you, what do you mean why? From all my sins. The guy didn't know if to laugh or to cry. For all your sins? What are your sins? You learn 20 hours a day Torah and you give your life for the Torah and for Hashem? The highest level possible? It's a sin. When do you have time to even make a scene if you sit all your, day, all your life into the Gemara? Where is the time to make scenes? So, but that's how he felt. That he has uh, Averot, and thanks to that, Hashem gave him suffering. We know that most of the suffering he got probably was to triple and quadruple, or whatever you want to call it, his reward. But the question is, how do you know? It doesn't take away from knowing. The answer is, if the suffering makes you unable to keep mitzvot and to learn Torah, it makes you, it causes you to lose reward. That cannot be because it's defeat the purpose. Whole purpose of Yisurim Shel Ava is to multiply your reward, to give you a bonus. You know, like in a, in a, in a game, in a casino, they say, okay, now you have, uh, I don't know, uh, you made a thousand dollars, they say, okay, all or nothing. In one, one shot, you double it, triple it, four times. I know a guy, very smart, he told me, if you know what you're doing, you'll never lose in gambling. I said, how? He said, I'll show you. He called my son. He said to him, he took a little piece of paper, made a ball out of it, very small. And he put the, the thing over there and he said, $10 that I score, it's betting with him now. He said, yes, he missed. I owe you 10 now, one more, on 20. So, missed. I owe you 30. Now, on 40. Let's do on 40. Missed. Now, 80. Miss. Now, 160. Miss. Now, 320. Miss. Now, 640. Score. Give me back everything. You always double. 
You can, you can lose 10 times the 11 times. One of the times, statistically, you must win. Right? If you throw a dice, you need a number six. One time, no. Second, third, four, 20, 30, oh, six. As long as you keep doubling and you have enough money, let's say you have a million dollar ready. And not even worry, he laugh. He was laughing and I was wondering. This guy is either a billionaire or he's extra genius. Extra, he knows something we don't know. <coughs> kept, kept missing until one went in. He got back everything. You understand the concept? All right. So now the point here, Hashem wants to give you an extra reward. If he gives you suffering that you cannot move out of the chair, you cannot get up, your back hurts, you cannot see, what kind of reward he gives you? He makes you unable to learn Torah, you cannot go into your chivruta, you don't have a, you don't have a life. Or you have to spend half of the time in hospitals with doctors. This kind of suffering is only, only punishment, only. Only suffering that you can still continue to learn Torah, you still have everything you need, your mind is still in the Gemara, you can still keep all the mitzvot. Only this kind of suffering is saf isurim shel ava. By the way, you should know, not everyone agree with this concept of isurim shel ava. There's arguments about it being Gdolei Israel, the Rishonim. If something like this even exists, right? If Hashem is is, is capable of giving someone suffering that he does not deserve to get it for the purpose of, of increasing his reward. There is such thing or not. There's arguments about it. Not everyone agree. Baruch Hashem, today it's, it was already accepted in a world of yeshivot that there is such a concept, Yisurim Shel Ava. Now, how do we know how do we know that life, every second of life, is a test? How do we know? There are a few options here. <coughs> the atheist option, achol v'shato ki machar namut. Eat and drink, enjoy the moment, because tomorrow you die and it's over. You know how the Israelis say? Enjoy, chayim pa'am achat, achi. You only live once. This option is heretic, heretic, it's wrong. You don't live once. First of all, you'll come back a few times in reincarnation. Second, you never die, the soul will never die, so there's no such thing you live once, because you never die. And you can come back here in a few different bodies and a few different life that you're going to have. So it's not true. Enjoy the moment, because anyway you die, that's a very stupid advice, because you enjoy the moment and you go against the Creator, there, there will be consequences to it. I'll give you an example. If I take you now to a restaurant, and I say, let's go to the most fancy restaurant exists in New York, thousand dollars a steak. You say to me, I'm sorry, <laughs> Corona wiped me out, I'm broke. I can't pay a thousand on a steak. So, don't worry. Did I tell you to pay? You don't worry. Why are you worry? Come and enjoy the steak. Take you to this fancy place. You're already eating the bones already. Then the waiter comes. I went to the bathroom. He comes to you, sir. Gives you the bill. Three thousand dollars, this dinner. What happened to you at that second? You're chewing the steak, you're enjoying, it's already on, stuck to your fork. You're about to push it in, and you just found out that I left, sir, he left. <laughs> and you have to pay the bill, I'm sorry. <coughs> and and you, have a, you still have half of the steak on the plate, and you're still starving. What happened to you in less than a second? You drop the fork. The last thing you care about is the steak. All the pleasure that was in the highest level of physical pleasure that you had a second ago got wiped out and turned into suffer. Whatever you ate right now immediately turned into a suffer. Why? Because you just discover 
the pleasure you just had in the last five minutes is going to cost you $3,000 and it's not worth it. What kind of a half a steak worth $3,000? So as soon as you found out the price, even the pleasure you had is gone. I used to have a guy coming to my lectures in New Jersey every week. I used to speak in a, in a restaurant called Perfect Pita in Fairlawn, New Jersey. I wonder if they're still in business. It was over 20 years ago. There was one Ashkenazi over there, Israeli guy, not religious. He used to come with a black leather jacket, blorit, I wife, Hawaii 5 O, you know, like the waves of Hawaii. <laughs> is blow it. And I, you know me, today I'm uh, a lot softer than when I was 20 years ago. <laughs> 20 years ago I was uh, I was a uh, commando. Today I'm already becoming a clerk <laughs> in the office. Back then, my lecture, especially the Hebrew one, it's possible that you faint in the middle of the lecture from fear. This guy, the Ashkenazi, Roni Brick, I used to see how he moved in a chair and he suffered, and he goes like this. You know, the entire two hours. Every time I finish the lecture, he jumped to be the first one. No, I can't do this to me. You can't do this to me. You're killing me. Look, this was 20 years ago, but I remember like it was an hour ago. He said... I feel like you take a big knife, as soon as you start the lecture, you stick it in my heart, and you rub it in for two hours. You rub it, and you rub it, and you rub it, and you kill me. Everything you speak about, it's me. You speak about this, I do this. You speak about that, I do that. You speak about that, I'm finished. I say to him, First of all, I have good news for you. If that's what you feel, you're already on the way to become a Baal Tshuva. Before you even change your ways. Because that's the necessary step to start your journey to do repentance. To feel shame and guilt and to understand that your way is crooked. I remember my rabbi used to send me letters. There's no emails and things like today, social media, 25 years ago. He used to send me letter by mail from Israel to America, you know, with an envelope. So one time I, I, I used to answer him with mail. <laughs> one time I asked him, but how can I give up the Goish music that I love so much? All these rock bands, I go to their concerts and this. How can I give it up? You know, I mean, you enjoy it so much. So he wrote to me, I remember. The fact that you asked me that question, how do I get rid of all these people? That's already a sign that you're in the right direction. Why? Because the way to become a Baal Tshuva is first to recognize that what you do is wrong. That's the problem today. Most of the secular people, they don't feel guilty because they have soft speakers everywhere they go that tell them you're tzaddik. Just give me the check and well, don't worry, continue to do whatever you like. None of them comes and say, you mechalel Shabbat, you're worse than a goy, look at you, you have no shirt at all to come. How, your wine is yain nesech. No one, no one talks about it. People are afraid. It's good, it's, it's enough, he comes to the synagogue, don't talk too, too strong, he may not come anymore. Everybody's good, all Jews are great. You know this nonsense, right? Beloni, let people live in illusion. I call it lectures of placebo. <laughs> placebo lectures. He thinks he goes to Shure Torah, 20 years later he's still Chiloni. Still the same jeans, the same holes in the knees, same garbage, same blurred, same cheating in the business, still stealing from the customer, still waking up at 11 o'clock. That's nothing changed. <laughs> Very nice, he comes to the synagogue at 10.30 in the morning for the chulent. Fantastic. Nothing changed by him. And he thinks he's about tshuva, but in Shammai he's zero. It's not made even one step forward. He just live an illusion like many of the Bali tshuva that I know. They live an illusion. It's 
especially here in America, because over here people are popping into their ego, you're great, you're that, you're such a tzaddik, and they live in illusion, what can you do? If you have very high cholesterol and your doctor tells you, don't worry, you're in a great shape, you're making a great progress, you continue to eat steak and fat and all kinds of bad things, oh, until you fall and die. By then it's too late already. Well, the doctor kept telling you, you're great. That's what made you worse. If you tell you, wake up before you die, before your sugar will kill you and will chop your legs off, how many people lost their legs because of sugar, because they eat all day sweet, diabetic? Millions lost their legs. They cut their legs off. Imagine 40, 45, no legs. Why? Because he eat all day sugar. All he had to do is to fight his desire and it would never happen. Or he gets blind. How many people lost their eyes because they eat sugar all the time? If they would watch the way they eat, it would not happen to them. How many people got AIDS for 10 minutes of, ple of forbidden pleasure? 10 minutes, that's it. Their whole life was destroyed. I can give you millions of other examples. So anyway, so this guy, the Israeli, he said, stick the knife in your rabbit, and rabbit, you kill me. I say, I have a feeling in two, three months you'll be a Bachur Yeshiva already. Baruch Hashem, he became Shomer Shabbat, he left uh, the forbidden girlfriend, started to eat kasher, started to change his lifestyle. That's it, I forgot about him. I stopped giving lectures over there. Maybe 15 years later, I have a lecture in Yehud, in Israel. Yehud, it's not far from Tel Aviv. I sit by the audience, I looked at the audience, who do I see there? This guy, Ronnie, the Ashkenazi. <laughs> Baruch Hashem, 15 years later, religious, living in Israel. Baruch Hashem, those lectures with a knife shook him up. Three, four, seven lectures. Not that many lectures there, maybe two months, three months, every week a lecture. That's it. Changed his life. Why? He got the point. The idea, is, the idea now is, how do I know by myself that Hashem is testing me every minute? One option, everybody can do whatever they get, can get away with, just enjoy the moment and finish. Obviously, that's against the Torah. Second option, few times in your life you're going to have a major test. But that's it. Not every second it's a test. Not every second is a test. There are days that you don't have tests. Once in a lifetime you have a big test. One big Rosh Yeshiva will come and cry to you that he's about to lose his Yeshiva and you're a very wealthy guy and he needs $30,000 to keep it open, otherwise he will have to go bankrupt and cannot pay the Avrechim. And you have 20, 30 million dollars and you could have given him 30,000 and he won't feel anything. You give him, you fulfill your mission in life. You don't give him, you fail in your entire life. Maybe that's what life is all about. Five, six cases like this, and that's it. <coughs> Third option, every second of your life is a test. There's not a second without a test. Which one of the three is the correct ones? <coughs> what do you think? The last one. The last one. Absolutely. The last one is the only correct one. The second option, it's also true. But it's not contradicting the third one. Life is always a test. However, there are some tests in life, some tests in life that are more major than the other. For instance, when you get married, you have two options in Shiduchim. One very religious, very modest, great midot, family religious, but no money. No money. You're going to have to pay everything. Ah, I'm going to pay for the wedding, I'm going to pay for the house, I'm going to pay for the car. What kind of a shiduch is that? <coughs> People are addicted to money today. They'll kill their own mother for money, some of them. So when they hear a shiduch like this, they get upset. Instead of being happy that they got a girl that wore a trillion dollars, they worry about $20,000 expenses. <laughs> when they get a trillion dollar gift, the girl have a value. What do you think? Take it for granted? Parents raised her in such a way she's worth trillions. <laughs> what do you worry about nonsense? Well, I see it everywhere I go. They always fight about money. 
So that's one option. Second option, a girl with money, prettier than the other one, but no Yerat Shamayim. High heels like the tripod. <laughs> See the tripod? Migdalei HaTeomim, the Twin Towers. Aleyhem HaShalom. Skirt, very tight. Above the knees. Fleshy hair, finish the duty free on her three times a day when she leaves to buy two tomatoes. <laughs> All day she wants to go in a mall. Now you have Amazon, but no more malls, but... So they make entertaining malls. You heard about the entertaining malls? But everywhere you will go, people will be so impressed by you. Why? Joey got a model. Wow, look at this guy. In Hebrew they say, He made it. But no irat shamayim. Not teilim, barely she dove in five minutes. Shabbat is not Shabbat. Yeah, she doesn't have to be the mother of your children. All about money and greed and vacations. That's all she cares about. Like many, many people from our communities. Money is their God. So now, now, you're going to make a decision. You're going to take the girl with the Irat Shamayim, but you're going to spend extra forty, fifty thousand dollars on the actual expenses. Oh, you're going to go with the rich girl that her father probably will give all the money and she's going to bring you a lot of honor because everywhere you're going to go, they're going to say, what a pretty wife you have and wow, you are such an achiever. But she will eat your heart with a spoon every day, little by little. Put it in a yogurt until your heart would be like the size of a quarter from eating it. You know, you eat your heart, nothing is left. So this is a choice that will affect your eternity. Do you understand me or no? It doesn't only affect your life here. It affects your eternity. I'll give you an example. Because marriage like that usually ends with a, with a very bitter divorce. Lawyers, hundreds of thousands of dollars, fighting about property, fighting for custody, fighting with the children, brainwashing the children against each other. The children become depressed and all kinds of mental issues they have because of such a broken home. And then, chas v'shalom, they become drug addicts or gays or who knows what else because of what they've seen in the house. And then you lose your entire genealogy. Now you don't have one tzaddik son or daughter. And they all, Hashem irachem, some of them will marry goyim or some of them will be divorced already three, four times. Everything I mentioned multiplied by millions of other problems and for the next generation, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, they all will be affected from it. It's all as a result of a test of one hour. One hour. You, you, you did not know who to choose. The righteous girl? Take some money out of your pocket and pay all the expenses because you have a jewel? Or you went with the money and the beauty and you're very shallow and you only care about the outside, which the Torah warns very much not to be like that. So one mistake, one mistake you make and chas v'shalom, you can be done. And I promise you that at least 50,000 times in the last 25 years, I've seen cases like this. 50,000 times at least, maybe double. Every day few. Every day few cases like this. Every day few cases like this. You understand Rabotai? So the question is Rabotai, how does a person know how to handle the test? How the person knows? Sometimes it's a matter of education. You know Torah or you don't know Torah. If you don't know Torah, you're going to make a mistake. What happens when you don't know Torah? You don't have, you don't have no Torah. What happens? When you don't know Torah, you need to have a good rabbi to direct you what to do. The problem is, will you listen to him or not? Will you listen to a rabbi or not? That's the question. Do you have a munat chachamim or not? Who can raise his hand over here 
and tell me that he has a chacham, that he follow his advices in, instru in instruction, everything he say, he always keep, he never questions what he said, who can tell me that he's in this level? That whatever the Chacham say, no questions asked, he doesn't let his feelings interfere, he's doing 100% what the Chacham told him. Who can tell me that he's in this level here? That's by the way mandatory to every Jewish person, male, female, young, old, everybody. Even if you yourself are rabbi. Why a rabbi needs a rabbi? He knows the whole Gemara, he knows Shulchan Aruch, he read thousands of books. What does he need? Doctor needs a doctor? Yes, because doctor cannot operate on himself. He needs somebody else to do the job. Dentist needs a dentist. Rabbi needs a rabbi. You may say, yes, but lawyer can represent himself. He knows the laws. Why does he need another lawyer? The answer is, when a person is involved with him, he doesn't see the reality in a correct way. En adam ro'e nega'e atzmo. You need someone to rule for you what to do. Why? Because you are bribed. It's a case about your son with his wife. You see the favor of your son. You don't see the justice. You don't see that what you think is good for your son, maybe it's poison for him. Because right now he's going to get away with that, but in five years from now it's going to be a hundred times worse. That's why you need a chacham. Why? Especially when it's something that involves with your life. It could be your marriage, it could be your children, it could be your partnership in a business. Let me read to you the words <coughs> of Rabbi Nachman Mibreslev about emunat chachamim. Let me read it to you. Of course, in every chacham talks about it. It came to me today, so I'll read it to you. Aklal ve'aikar. The general rule and the main thing is Leizaher bikvodam shel chachamim To be very careful with honoring the chachamim Velira mehem meod To fear them very much I understand to respect the chachamim Baruch Hashem in the Syrian community From generations to generations Even the ignorant people Even the secular people they have some special respect for a Chacham. They see Chacham, Chacham, Tfadal, here, Chacham, I don't know, he needs help, he needs a right. Even he's not religious, Bechlal. Chacham for him, it's still something special. Some communities, not only they don't respect the Chacham, they are allergic to him. As soon as he comes in, they want to kill him, to throw rocks at him. There are people like this. I'm, I've been everywhere, I see how people talk. They brainwash from the media, from all the wicked people, what do you expect? But over here, Baruch Hashem, even people that are barely religious, a little bit traditional, I've seen throughout the years, if somebody comes to the house, Chacham, wow, they're going to go out of the way to help in any possible way. Why? Because it's uh, inherit, they inherited from their parents and grandparents in hundreds of years from Syria and Lebanon. That was the tradition. The people understood what it means, Chacham. You don't mess with the Chacham. You don't get burned, you destroy your life by disrespecting a Chacham. They knew it. This is the Torah. It's not something specifically to Syrian or Lebanese or others. That's everywhere, every Jew. What does it mean to fear them? What does it mean? Why you have to be afraid of the Rabbi? Why? For a very simple reason. One mistake and you lost your Olam Abba. One mistake. What does it mean, one mistake? Tiny mistake. Tiny, not significant at all. You can lose your olam abba. That's what the Gemara say. It's halacha, by the way. For instance, you go with your rabbi to a place and somebody asks a question in halacha and you jumped and you answer before the chacham answer. More halacha bifne rabo, chayav mita. That sentence was written to you that second in Shemayim. Now Hashem may have mercy on you because he knows you don't know. You may not know. Maybe he came out with, by instinct. You didn't really mean it. Okay. But you understand what it means? It's a begachalatam. You speak about him. You disrespected him. You chas v'shalom can bring a very big problem for yourself. That's why velira mehem. Meod. Very much. 
ואף אם נדמה לו שהוא עושה חס ושלום, even if you see something the חכם did, that doesn't look to you that that's what the Torah say to do. You don't know the, the whole details of the story. You don't know the details of the story. There was one big חכם, he writes in his book הלכות. His assistant said that one time a girl came, it was an emergency, and he told her to do the opposite of what's written in his books. Complete opposite. So now if somebody would see such things, ah, that's what he said. What kind of a rabbi is this? This is the biggest hacham, not just a small one. Why? That's what the difference between an ordinary hacham to a real giant hacham. Somebody asked, Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul, Zatzal, about Rav Ezra Atiyah. So he said to him, comparing us, the Chachamim, to Rav Ezra Atiyah, meaning me, Chacham Ovadia, Chacham Raful, all the Chachamim that came out of Porat Yosef. That's what Rav Ben Zion told him. Comparing us to Rav Ezra Atiyah is like comparing a person to a monkey. Comparing monkey to a person, they look a little bit alike. Same nose, eyes, you know, same, same ligaments, DNA, very similar. And everybody understands monkey is a monkey, the person is a person. And then he said that Rav Ezra Atiyah said the difference between a chacham to a complete chacham, it's like from one side of the world to the other. He said it's like a, a monkey to a person. So that means you can have somebody that it's such a chacham, he will give you a year lecture, a year of Divrei Torah. But he's not considering the standards of the Torah a complete chacham, whatever that means, leave it alone for now. A complete chacham, it's like comparing um, a kof before Adam. That's what Rabbi Ezra Atiyah used to say. You understand? So how far we are from understanding what it means to be a perfect, a complete chacham. What's a complete Chacham? Chazonish. That's a perfect example. Chazonish <coughs> did the maximum he could have done in his lifetime. He could not have done 1% more. To the point that one time the Chazonish had a bed and a chair and a table one step away from the bed. That was his learning room. And all the time he was learning. One time the Chazunish got up from the chair to try to go to the bed, one step, he fell on the floor. Boom! I was small, short, skinny, very. He sometimes learned for three days straight. Three days straight, he doesn't move from the chair. Three days without sleeping. It's unheard of. Everything you see in Bnei Brak today, Chazunish, when he came there, it was desert. He decided it's going to be a city of Torah. It's all him. All the Torah of Bnei Brak in hundreds and hundreds of big yeshivot, Hasidim, Litaim, Svaradim, Temanim, Bate Knesset, Mikvaot, everything goes to his account. He made Bnei Brak what it is. It's unheard of. So he fell on the floor. So they came to pick him up. What happened, Rabbi? He said, I miscalculated the, dif the distance between the chair to the bed. <laughs> I left myself enough energy by the end of the day when I finished to learn to be able to do two steps and fall on a bed. And now I learn a little bit more, meaning I didn't have that strength. Fell on the floor, they had to pick him up. Do you understand what it means? This is in our time, 50 years ago. That's it. In our generation. Your grandparents were with him at the same time. This is to show you what it means. There was nothing else just the highest level that a Jew can reach in, on earth. With poverty, with nothing, with no children. Look at this Nisyonot. Nisyonot, no children, all his life. Lubavitch and Rebbe, no children. Rashi, no sons. Only three daughters. Baruch Hashem, each one of them married a big giant Chacham. But there was a lot of Nisyonot, even to the righteous people. Let's finish what he said. What the Rav said, 
even when it looks like Chaz V'Shalom, he does something against Torah or against Halakha, you must trust him that he knows exactly what needs to be done right now. The Torah was given to Chachmei Ador. The Torah is a raw diamond in the hand of the Chachamim. One will make it round, one will make it marquise, one will make it square. Why? Because I gave them the authority. Iftach bedoro keshmuel bedoro. Iftach in his generation, like Shmuel in his generation, even though Iftach is not nothing compared to Shmuel. But in his time, that was the leader. In our days, we have few Chachamim, they are the leaders. They decide what to do. That's it. Don't ask questions. Chacham told you what to do. Ramazu say something. Rav Yitzchak Yosef say something. Chacham Shalom Cohen say something. Enough. Enough with your ego. Enough with your speeches. You disagree, be quiet at least. I say to people, there's, one, there's, two, there's two level of wickedness. There's one thing, you come to the Chacham and you don't want to cancel your, yourself in front of the Chacham. Chacham tell you do this and you disagree with him. You think you're some big shot doctor, you know better. There is a worse level that you already go and preach against the Chacham. He told me this, but what does he know? I'm telling you, that's not the right way. That's bechlal, nothing to talk about. I say to people, at least be quiet. You don't want to get vaccine. At least talk. Don't talk. Why are you openly attacking what the Gdolei Ador say to do? You're afraid. You have all kinds of complications in your head. You watch too many stupid videos. You convince already that uh, Nivero star is about to hit New York and we're going to die tomorrow. Okay, follow your nonsense. But at least don't talk. No, but they all must have a blog and write in a Facebook page and send on WhatsApp 5,000 messages every week. Why? That's the answer of us. I wish those guys would have such devotion for Torah to transfer messages of Torah. When we say it's short clips, video that can save life, proofs, wake-up call, preparation for holiday, something, Shabbat, barely anyone shares. We have a lecture now, not even 10% of the people agree to share. After 500 times I warn them that everyone who watch my lecture and does not share it, it's gazel. I don't allow anyone to watch it without sharing. Say it cl- I said it clearly. I said I don't care to lose 90% of my views and many left. Tell me I'm sorry, I'm not going to share. Goodbye. Go find someone else. You don't care saving other Jews and spreading Torah, you don't deserve to hear Divrei Torah. Simple as that. That's it. You don't have to agree. Fine, there's Baruch Hashem a lot of speakers. Find one. Other ones don't care. You share, you don't share. And they still watch, and they still don't share. Why? Yetzirah. Why wouldn't you share? The one hour that you just heard could have become 10,000 hours for your account. If it would be money, do you think there would be one guy that wouldn't share? If you would get, for every person you share with, 10 bucks, and you have 300 people in your Facebook page, multiply by $10, $3,000 for clicking on a button. Back, $3,000. What would you do? Open another 20 groups. <laughs> and every lecture of every speaker that is kosher, all day you would sit and share. You wouldn't even go to work. What are you doing, Moshe? The store in Manhattan. There's nobody there. Forget the store. What store now? I make $30,000 a day by clicking buttons. <laughs> by not doing it, you actually say that saving souls and earning billions of mitzvot from the Torah is not equal to you like money. You rather get the money, but you do not want to spread the Torah of Hashem. This is just to show you how the Yetzirah works. Everything else, when there's no Yetzirah, if there's music, people share. Comedy, I'll give you an example. Go on YouTube, take the best speaker in Israel. Great lecture he gave, how many views he gets? Maximum 100,000. Barely find more than that. Go to a comedian that just started his career six months ago. 19 years old, Joker. With his bald head, shiny like this, Temani, Yemenite, 19 years old. Saying 
40 men as jokes, 13 million, 7 million, <laughs> 7 million views, by right? jokes. I have one lecture that in the first 10 minutes I spoke about jokes. It was in Canada, in Toronto. Somebody cut that and say he, in Hebrew, hilarious. Something like to die from laughing, something like that. Posted in less than a month, 350,000 views. Why? Jokes. You're going to say basketball best moves of some bum from, from, I don't know, from where. Became a basketball player. 60 million views. Singer, hundreds of millions. Most beautiful homes in Hollywood, five mil 500 million views. Oxygen to the soul, life of eternity, 20,000 views. True or false? Why? Why? Yetzerara. Yetzer, the same Yetzerara that tell you don't listen or definitely don't share with others is that Yetzerara will tell you there's a great basketball video. The great Hollywood video. There's a great sport. There's a great comedy. Same Yetzirah. That tells you what, you're crazy? You're going to get people angry. Why? Why do you want your friends to know that they have to keep Shabbat? That they have to eat kosher? This is the reality of our life. So the Rav continue, and he say, first of all, don't ask questions, and definitely don't open your mouth. If you disagree, you have a big problem. But how do you dare to go and contradict in public? Not only that, now he's finishing his words, and that's the main thing I wanted to read to you. He says like this, just count on them, throw your mind away, and count on the perfect Chachamim to direct you what to do. Top. Next paragraph, all medicine, all medicine depend on the Torah. And the Torah was given to the Chachamim. And we are obligated to listen to them and we are not allowed to move from the words left or right. Someone that disrespects the words and does not believe in what they say, right? What happened to someone like this? Or he thinks that from the Torah there's no such an obligation. Maybe the Chacham exaggerated. על ידי זה נכלה במכה שאין לה רפואה הוא מת בה. He got a sickness that has no cure and he died. And that's what happened to hundreds of Israelis in Israel. They are dead only for one reason. Because they refused to take the vaccine. If they would get it, they wouldn't die. 47 women yesterday in bed and critical condition in Israel, none of them got the vaccine. To so get the vaccine, they would not be in a hospital. From the minute they got the vaccines out, the numbers went down by 80%. Every day there will be 100 people die in January. 100, 96, 85, 88. Now it went down to 10, 15. Still a big number, but a massive drop. Why? It works. Now we have a chas v'shalom, I hope not, a new mutation. And if it's, if it's true and the vaccine cannot handle it, because they all get vaccinated, these old people, we are back to square one. Now let's clarify the question that I ask, and then we give time for questions. How do we know that every second of life is a test? How do we know? <coughs> when you sleep, you're in a test or no? You are in a test when you sleep. Where is the test when you sleep? First of all, how you sleep. Did you say Shema before or no? How you dress when you sleep? A lot of people sleep with no clothes. You come to wake him up in the morning. What's wrong? What's up when you're in a beach? No shirt. Why don't you wear pyjama? Why not Tsanua? I'm alone in the room. Under the blanket. Why should I be Tsanua? In the bathroom you have to be tsanua, yes. When you take off the pants, you cannot do whatever you want. You can sit naked there, why? You're alone in the bathroom, nobody sees you. <coughs> why? Shekoho gvurato male olam, akashvachu everywhere, no? I once, uh, when I was uh, in the beginning of my career, 
What happened? <laughs> Did I miss something? Uh, people sleep here without shirts? Shem <laughs> irachem. It's too hot. So, here it's too hot here. The heat in the sun is too hot. How you sleep, what side, middle of the night, later you flip to the other side, all these are hot. Also, how long you sleep. What time you went to sleep? What time you wake up? Shh. There is a botai alachot even how to sleep. Did you know that if you sleep close to an expensive vase and in the middle of the sleep you stretch your arm and you knock it down as a million dollar, you are obligated to pay in bedin? You come and say, I'm sorry. That's not my fault, my host. I asked them permission to sleep there for Shabbos. They're very rich people. Why did I have to put such an expensive vase next to my bed? How do you expect me in the middle of the night not to move and knock it down? It's not my fault. I will never knock it down. I'm not guilty. Good claim or bed? Bad. Huh? Bad. Why bed? Why it's a bad claim? You cannot be responsible for what you do in the middle of the night. Very good. The Gemara says, Adam Muad Leolam. Person always capable of making damages. So before you went to sleep, you know you cannot control yourself when you sleep. You had to move the vase away from the bed. Right or wrong? Because now when you did not move it, you knocked it down. Same thing when you get drunk. You're allowed to get drunk? Never. Even on Purim, you're not allowed to get drunk. It's a big mistake to get drunk in Purim. One Hasid got drunk, he hit a black woman in Edison, New Jersey, killed her on the spot. <coughs> this year? This year, yes, a few days ago, Purim. Why? Why are you drunk and why you get on a wheel when you're drunk? See, drunk people, when they get on a wheel, they don't think that it's that bad. That's the whole point of being drunk. You don't look how you look. You don't understand. You're not aware of, of what a Chilul Hashem you cause. I want to ask you. It's mitzvah to drink in Purim, to be in a very good mood, until you don't know the difference between Arur Aman and Baruch Mordechai. Come on, it's a joke. You drink two bottles of whiskey and you will still know who is Aman and who is Mordechai. You only will talk like a monkey, <coughs> make faces and, you know. But you will still know. So what the Chachamim wanted you to kill yourself? To have alcohol poisoning? To die? For, for Purim? What's so urgent here? Of course not. Besides, which Avera has the biggest punishment in the Torah? Chilul Hashem. Who would let you make a rabbinical mitzvah as a price of Chilul Hashem that you lose your Olam Abba? That's it. That's common sense. No permission to get drunk. You don't know how to drink? Don't drink. Drink grape juice. Taste a little bit? Fine. Yatsati de Dechova. Why? You can't control yourself? Depends. Some people, like, like donkeys, one glass of wine, oh, they jump on the table, dance, break things. Some people can drink a whole bottle and they never get drunk. I can drink a whole bottle in one, in five minutes, I don't get drunk. The opposite. You get into a good mood, like some kind of a mood, and the, all the Torah comes out. When you get drunk, the real truth of you comes out. If it's negative, the negative comes out. If it's positive, the positive comes out. We had a Rav in Yeshiva 20 years ago, an ocean of Torah, ocean. Unbelievable. Rav Rosenman, Tzadik Esodola. I once asked him, Rabbi, did you ever get angry once in your life? Because I saw, no matter what you do, he always had this smile on his face. So he looked at me, you're not allowed to, to get angry. <laughs> I say, yeah, we also know it. It doesn't work for us so much. Did you ever get angry? Never got angry in his life. I'm so shy when I ask him that question. He doesn't know what it means to get angry. 
מצד שלבל אוף אמונה אין השם, אמונה קריצות פרום השם, הוא לא יגיע להם קריאת. I want to share the beautiful example if you walk in the street and somebody come from behind and hit you on your back. Boom! I broke your spine. The blood goes express into your brain. Your fist is ready. You're about to turn around and give him such one to the face, knock him out for a month. You turn and you see the rabbi from your elementary yeshiva that you love the most and save your life. That's him. What happened to the feast? Open quickly. Oh, rabbi, you smile, you're happy, you give him a hug, kiss his hand. Just the second ago before you saw who gave you the punch, you are ready to give him a one and break his teeth. As soon as you saw who gave you the punch, your entire attitude changed 180 degrees. In less than a second. That just show you that anger can be under control always and fully. All you have to remember is who gave me this test? Who gave me this problem? Thank you. Thank you that you even care about me. Thank you that you care what I do. That's already a huge achievement. If you see a father that have five kids and one of them, he doesn't even care anymore what he does. He comes up 3 a.m., he will sleep until 12, nothing. He doesn't make it, nothing. Only streak with the other four. Where are you? Why you didn't come to shul? Why, why you didn't wake up on time? Why you didn't say Kriyat Shema? Why this? Why you eat in that restaurant? What about him? Leave him alone. There's no point. The kids, they jealous with the bum. Why with me you're so strict and he does whatever he wants? If they will be smart, they will be honored. I ha it happened to me with one kid. I was doing bad things in the park at 1 a.m. His father came. Grabbed him from the air, threw him in a car, took him to the house, threw him in a, in a room. He said, one week you don't come out of here. The kid came to me and said, my father hate me, embarrassed me in front of my friend. What kind of a father is this? So I said to him, you fool. There's nobody that his father loves him so much like he loves you. He came at 1 a.m. to look where you are, grabbed you, saw you do bad things. But he didn't do anything to my friends. I said to him, of course you fool. He doesn't care about your friends. What is this his business, your friends? He only care about you because you are his son. We are the Jewish people. Hashem care about us more than any other nation. That's why he keeps giving us punches non-stop. Every hour. For 3,000 years. Do you have a day without tragedies? <clears throat> a day without suffering? A day without all kinds of strange death? Day without financial problems, day in a world without antisemitism. One day that the United Nations would leave us alone without some antisemite decision. One day that the Arabs would leave you alone. One day that you'll be able to do something that you really want to do. Oh, always an obstacle, always a problem. Everywhere you go, Jewish nations suffer more than anybody in the world. It's not, a, it's not something new. But that's a very good sign. That means Hashem is not giving up on us. He keeps giving us smacks. That means I'm watching, I'm expecting, and I'm trying to wake you up. So, Abutai, how do I know that every second is a test? The answer is, every second in life, you can either do a mitzvah or an avera. You agree with that? Every second. Because every second is subject to good or bad, every second, that means if you're gonna do bad, you just fail in that second. If you do good, you just did the right thing. That means every second that you're not doing the right thing, you're actually failing. And every second that you are doing something productive, you are actually passing the test. You may say, okay, I understand your concept. When I walk now on Shabbat, 7 a.m., to the synagogue, I understand that I'm going to do a mitzvah. But what about the 10 minutes that I walk? Enjoy the weather, look around. This is a mitzvah, that's nothing. I just walk in the street. Every step is a part of a mitzvah. The mitzvah started 
when the first step you came out of your house to the direction of the synagogue to daven or to learn, from the minute you started to go, the mitzvah began. There is two levels in mitzvah. There is the mitzvah itself, and there is machshire mitzvah. When the moel prepare everything for the breed, cutting the, 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 the bandage and bringing this and putting the alcohol and, cut, and tying the baby, it's already machshire mitzvah. The Gemara asks, are you allowed to hit water on Shabbat? The baby needs hot water after the breed. He needs hot water to rinse, to watch. Winter time, you don't want to kill him with cold water. There's a, there's, according to Rabbi Eliezer, you heat up the water in Shabbat. Can Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, chapter 19. In Perik de Rabbi Eliezer de Mila. Chachamim disagree. They say everything you can prepare from before, you prepare from before. But the, the idea is that even when the wife cooks for Yom Tov, the actual cooking, which is really nothing, she cooks every day. Now she cooks for Pesach, she's going to put it later on in the freezer, and she takes it out in Chol HaMoed and serve it or whatever, that's already a mitzvah of preparation for Pesach. And the cleaning is mitzvah, and going shopping for your wife is a mitzvah, and listening to CDs is a mitzvah when you drive in a car, Watching your eyes is a mitzvah, where you're heading is a mitzvah or avera. Depend where you are going to. Many people tonight came here. Some people went to different places. If you had now an option to come tonight to listen to an hour and a half of Divrei Torah, which is 90,000 mitzvot, or to go play basketball. To go play basketball in the gym, it's also mitzvah. You want to lose some weight, you want to lower cholesterol, you want to feel better, you want to lose weight, you want to look better for your shiduch. It's also a positive thing. But you compare this to 90,000 mitzvot, why don't you go to play in the night there's no shiur? You have to arrange the schedule correctly. Many times people don't come on my Tuesday night lecture. Where were you last Tuesday? Oh, I'm sorry, Rabbi, I had to go to a birthday party. Birthday party of my niece. What exactly mitzvah is to go to a birthday party of your niece, to sing to her happy birthday when she blow the candle off? What is the mitzvah? No, Rabbi, you know, family, this, that. He gives up a two-hour shiur, 120,000 mitzvot, to go sit. And I don't want to tell you sometimes it's Lashonara there and women comes not mothers and other problems. I'm, not, I'm assuming that everything is kosher. And I'm assuming that you actually went there Lashem Shamaim because you wanted to make them happy. So you did one mitzvah and you lost 120,000 mitzvot. Very simple. Even if you have to go save life on the expense of losing an hour of learning Torah, you lost more than you gain. You must go and save life. If you're at Salah, you sit in, a, in yeshiva now, and you got a 911 call to go save life, you must close the Gemara and go. There's no question about it. If you ignore the call and the person will die, you are guilty of it. But when you run and save his life and drive him to the hospital, and thanks to you, he's alive. How wonderful you feel. Wow, I just save life every day almost. Thanks to me, people stay alive. Without me, they would be dead. I happened to be there. I went with my scooter, with my ambulance. A hundred percent. You have a huge mitzvah of saving life. You have everything you can say. It's true. There's one thing you forgot. One hour of Torah is much, much, much higher than saving life. And that's not my opinion. The Gemara say, Gadol Talmud End of story. I don't care what you think and what your friends think and even what your liberal modern rabbi think. We only care what the Torah say. The Torah say, Gadol Talmud Torah Yoter Matzalat Nefashot. Now I'm going to give you even a bigger chidush. Someone came to the Chazonish. And he said to him, maybe I should learn half a day that the rest of the time I will do kiruv. Save souls. Go give lectures to chilonim. Make them closer to the Torah. The Chazunish said it's a very big mitzvah to save, but you should know 
that sitting in yeshiva full time and learning, it's also count like saving souls. Why? Nobody will do tshuva without the merit of the nation of Israel sitting and learning Torah. Without it, no one will do tshuva. You should know we give the strength and the fuel to those who go and save souls out there because without our Torah, the world does not even exist. The existence of the world is thanks to what we do. The blessing of the Jewish nation is thanks to the Torah. Parnasa, thanks to the Torah. Health, thanks to the Torah. I'll give you an example. The Gemara say, Talmidei Chachamim are duty exempt. They don't have to pay taxes. They don't have to pay security in town. They have to build a wall. They have to put patrol, people on horses, to pay the money, to, to, to guard us from the, from the anti-Semite goim who wants to come and attack the village. Everybody must pay, and divide, they divided by how many citizens live in a town for the security, except the Talmidei Chachamim. They don't have to pay. Why? It's not fair. Ma. Now you live here in Brooklyn. You have houses, you have to pay real estate tax, school tax. The town care if you Talmid Chacham or not? If you're the chief rabbi of the shul, if you're an ordinary businessman, they care? They send you the tax bill, pay it. Rabbi X, Rabbi Y, pay exactly like the taxi driver. Same thing. Everybody pays. The Torah forbid. You're not allowed to bother the Talmidei Chachamim with expenses like this. Why is it? Who knows? Because all the reason we need security is because of all these people who neglected the learning of the Torah and they don't keep mitzvot properly. If there would be all Talmidei Chachamim and Tzadikim, who would need security? Bichla? Read in Parashat Bechukotai, all the tragedies that come to the Jewish nation come because of the sins that people do, lack of learning, lack of Shabbos, intermarriage, lack of emuna. Read Parashat Bechukotai, it gives you the list of all the things that we do. All of us do it. That's why the Arabs torturing us, that's why we, Israel became smaller, that's why this pandemic, everything is written in the Torah. Everyone was a tzaddik, Hashem will give us pandemic. Not only that, there was one time a case in the Torah that the Romans came to Rebbe, he was the president of the Romans. They say, we want to give a special necklace jewel to the Caesar, it costs a few million dollars, or gold and rubies, whatever it is. All of you Jewish community have to pay this amount. If not, you're gonna have problems. You have to raise the money and give it to us by this day. Wow, they went crazy. Wow, so much money. Why are we gonna have to pay enough for this jewel? They came to Rebbe, Rebbe, well, we have to collect. He said, you collect, but don't bother the Talmidei Chachamim. Those who sit and learn all day, don't ask them to participate in a payment. Just the people who goes to work, they will pay. The people who goes to work got angry. What? We have to pay for them also? It's not enough, we have to pay for this uh, Goy uh, Caesar. Now I have to pay for all this Talmidei Shiva. Well, at least they didn't say parasites, like they say today. They respected the Talmidei Shiva, they just didn't want to pay their share. Okay. So Rebbe say yes. Why do you think this decree came to town? Because of those who sit and learn Torah all day, or because of people like you? You know what? If that's how you talk to us, Rabbi, with all due respect, we will pack our stuff and leave town. Back then, it wasn't like today. If you want to sell your house, it will take you a year. <laughs> until you pack, until you find a car. Back then, you put everything in a carriage. Well, how many things do you have? It's not, we didn't have the lifestyle we have. Packed everything, clothed everything in one thing, and leave. Go to a different place. So the Rebbe told them, no problem. You can all leave. I said, what are you going to do? If all the business people would leave town. It happens now in New York. Everybody leaves Manhattan now after the riots. People came to the conclusion, what do I need this Sodom? People run away. Vacant apartment left and right everywhere. For rent stores left and right everywhere. Rent already dropped 40% or more. 
Everybody ran to where, even I heard from here that a lot of Syrians moved to Deal, all year round. One person told me the yeshiva went up to 700 kids, two and a half times more. Why? Because a lot of family moved there. Why do I need to be here? Riots, danger, high taxes, traffic, problem, camera every block in Ocean Parkway. Let me run away from this nightmare. They moved out. Some people now moving to Florida. <coughs> Not a stupid liberal leftist state. Baruch Hashem, at least Republican, they're a little bit more common sense. No state tax. You don't have to pay 8.5% on, on all your income. Some people make millions. They put themselves an address in Florida. They save themselves hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes. So they move. They also hate the weather here. Ooh, it's freezing. Let me move to Florida. There's only one problem. You move to Florida, you finish your kids, you finish your future, you finish all your Yiddishkeit. Remember my words. Over there, nobody will be a tzaddik. Nobody. Here at least there are some kids that become Bnei Torah, the serious yeshivot. You move to Florida because you like the lake and the yacht and the sun and the shish kebab in your backyard, and much cheaper homes, and less taxes. Yes, of course, how do you want the Satan to convince you to leave a place of Torah with the tortures and the suffering? How is the Satan going to convince you if it's going to be riots there, and, and it's going to be expensive there, and you pay full taxes over there, and everything over there will be like here with no Torah? Who would move there? Right? You get the point? Same thing with the Goyot. One guy told me, Rabbi, I already Shomer Shabbat, I eat kosher, I come every day to Shiurim, I learn. There's only one thing I cannot do. What? I cannot break up with my Goya girlfriend. I can't. So I said to him, you must. That's what Hashem wants. Work on it. So then he asked me, but why Hashem made this goyot so pretty? Why does it have to be so hard? I said to him, if all the goyot would be ugly, who would want to go with them? No one. So nobody would have a test. So how will Hashem give you a test to give you a huge reward? Send you a nice looking person or send you a monkey? With monkey, you don't want to get married. You don't want to break the rules of the Torah for a monkey. But you want to do it for someone that you think you're going to get some pleasure in this life. Why? Because you compromise on the truth of Hashem for a temporary pleasure of the moment. In English it's called penny wise, dollar foolish. Now let's finish by telling you from the Torah sources that you are tested every second. From the Torah, Vahi Achara Devarim Ha'ele, Vahi Lokim Nisa et Avraham. Hashem came to Avraham. He gave him Yitzchak after all these years he waited, 100 years of wait. He got married at age 25. Now he's 100 years old, 75 years until he finally got a, a, a baby. Now it's 37 years later, you raised him, he's ready for marriage. You're finally happy, someone will take over all my billions, was very wealthy, Avraham. And then you get the shock of your life, take him and kill him. And everyone will make fun at you, and you told all the goyim, don't kill your children, that's not what Hashem wants, and now they're going to see you kill your own son. And your wife will go crazy mentally, wow, I waited for him for so many years. Right? So what happened? Big Nisayon, what does he do? Wake up five in the morning, Rashkem Avram Baboke, run quickly, beg Hashem, let me do the slaughtering. No, no, you pass the test. Let me do a scratch. Why the Torah gives you the story? That's a school for life. This is what I expect each one of you to be. And another place it's in the Torah, Kimen Nasei Hashem Etchem. I'm testing you to see what's in your heart. Will you keep my mitzvot or not? How do you test a person? You give him a million dollar a day? That's a test? Nah. How do you test a person? Up and down, get fired, cannot find a job, uh, cannot find a place next to the shul, have to walk an hour every Shabbat. A lot of, a lot of different tests. The boss abuses him, the boss makes fun of him, doesn't pay him on time, 
anti-Semitism, bad neighbor, son that eats his heart, wife that give him hard time, husband that is not so good. Everybody has a real pekale, serious package. One of the biggest nisyonot of today is the shiduchim. Last time when I was here, we spoke about it. You, know, you saw how many people watched that lecture? It went all over, over 100,000 views we had. Zchut, whoever organized it, zacha, kanait olamo. Baruch Hashem. And a lot of people got an idea about the shiduchim. Now I have to know one thing. It's true that today is very difficult to find a good shiduch that will be a good match to you. But it's 100% our fault. It's not a decree from Hashem. <clears throat> that sometimes Hashem gives a punishment to the generation, a decree, like Arabs. They'll eat your heart every second in Israel. You live in fear, attacks, terrorism, Allah Akbar, everywhere you go, you gotta live with that. That's a curse. Cancer in the body, you gotta live with that. There's nothing you can do. Shiduchim, it's not a decree from Hashem. Of course, Hashem decides who's gonna get Shiduch and who won't, who will have a chance and who will not, for different reasons, depend how we behave, but the Shiduchim, we bring it on ourselves. And we'll finish right here. Then I'll give you some time for questions. We bring it on ourselves. Let me give you a list of things, of mistakes that we do in the Shiduchim that caused us to stay single. One, we are racist. I don't want this, I don't want that, I don't want that kind, I don't want this one, I, don't, I only want from my own nationality. Uh, okay, I have someone from a different country, but it's a great girl, tzaddika, nice, good family, very humble. No, 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 she's not from the community, I don't want her. Problem that caused thousands of people to lose their shiduch for life, not just temporarily, for life. Because Hashem decided, this girl, from this country, will be the wife of this guy from this country. And he refused, he doesn't even give a chance to go out with different girls unless they are from the community. End of story, he'll stay single for the rest of your life, for his life, unless he's gonna say, whatever comes, I'm willing to test. I have priorities. I would rather someone with the same background like me, someone from the community, someone that we know and we have the same customs. That's perfectly fine. So if you, for instance, you're Syrian, if they offer you a Syrian girl or Dugma, a Persian girl, but of course you're gonna want a Syrian as a first priority. That's perfectly fine. Hashem understands that. But if they tell you that the Syrian is very shallow and barely religious and Chaz Shalom has horrible midot and she's whatever, and the other ones is great and righteous and and devoted, and da, 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 da. who should you go first with? If you say, no, no, but she's not one of us, I want the other one, that means you're a fool, because you're going against Hashem's will. And if you're going to do it, don't be surprised that you later pay the price 20 years later. That's one thing. Second, so, you try. You try this, you try that, and then eventually you'll be surprised. Uh, you know, we have a girl that uh, she been I always told her, you want to know why you're still not married? Because you are overqualified. No man that I met deserve to get a girl like you. That's the truth. She said, no, you're exaggerating. You don't know me enough. This, I said, trust me. I know what I'm talking about. Great Ashkafa, class, wisdom, modesty, everything, devotion. I'm amazing. Love Torah, full of life. Mentally stable. Nobody, nobody is a good match. So then they said, we have, a, we have a guy for her. Completely different than her. Different nationality. <laughs> so different. Uh, who would ever believe? So they asked me, what do you think? The one who wanted to organize the Shidduch. I said, you have to try. Tzadeket, Tzadik, Ben Torah, lover of Torah, completely two different mentalities. But they have one thing unites them, Hashem and the Torah. They learn to learn with each other, to live with each other. They say, nah, I don't think there's a chance. Ah, they are so different. She's like this, he's like, say, do it. 
ברוך השם, בלי עין הרע, second amazing date is scheduled. First one was extremely good. בלי עין הרע, I hope it's gonna go well to the end. But this is just an example, if one of the two were racist, I'm like this, I want like this, I don't want like this, who knows if both of them will not die single, God forbid. That's have to finally penetrate your head. Whenever you speak to someone about Shiduchim, I'm open for every good religious girl. I'll go on a date, I check who she is, we have something in common, I don't care where she's from and what's her accent. I see she's good, she's nice, she's nice looking in my eyes as a woman, which I told you in the last lecture, that's step number one, first you check if you like her as a woman, not as Sarai Menu. If she's gonna be Sarai Menu, but you don't like how she looks, that's not a marriage. You have to know the, the priorities. Top. That's one example. Second example, money. Almost everybody, first question, will they support? Will they support? Let's see as a son learning yeshiva. Okay, uh, amazing girl. Will they support? How much will they give? They have money? Or by people who don't learn? Regular, ordinary, religious people. First thing they tell the Shatchanim, do not offer us anyone poor. Even if they're rich. That's what eats my heart. If they are poor and they don't have a munah in Hashem, they're afraid that they'll offer them another poor. Poor and poor, in such materialistic world, is not easy. I understand why they are weak in their munah, that's why they're afraid. But what happened with a multi-millionaire family of a girl, and they're giving them a bachur yeshiva, poor. Doesn't have anything. But an angel, Ben Torah, will be a chief rabbi one day. No, no, we don't want. Why don't want? They don't have anything. Why, we're going to pay for everything? Why not? Why Hashem gave you so much money, you think? You have five, six girls. For each one of them, He gave you half a million dollars to buy them a place, to help them in a marriage, to support monthly. Now you don't want to support. What do you think will happen? Hashem will clean you with all the money. Made the full come and clean you out. You could have got yourself wonderful chatanim, but you're stupid and stingy, and because of that, your daughters are home at 35-40, because you did not want to give what Hashem gave you for that purpose. You wanted to keep it in your pocket. Imagine the mailman supposed to deliver from Ruven to Shimon a package with money or checks, and he keeps it in his pocket. Deliver? I can't let go. You're the mailman. What's parents? Parents are babysitter. That's what they are. You have to raise them, get them to the chupa, Help them in the beginning until they walk on their own. You saw the mother elephant, how she kicked the head of the baby that was just born. Make sure he's able to walk. From the minute he begins to walk, that's it, he's on his own. That's it, he's in nature. This is the parents. So money, many times money come immediately after the wedding. How our parents in Israel got married. If you would hear the stories my father used to tell me, how hard it was. Israel just became a state, 1940, 41. The British was there, the Arabs, the war. 17 years old kids went to fight with primitive guns, with these bloodthirsty Arabs in, uh, in Ramle, in Lourdes, shooting, killing people. Every hour someone died, nothing to eat. The British give you food stamps. You come, you get a bag of flour, the whole family eat bread all week. Nobody has shoes, they cut the front of the shoes, all kids share one pair of shoes. And they had to get married. Where would they live? They lived by the parents' living room. One over there, they put a blanket from the ceiling, they, they divide the room. Chacham Ovadi Yosef said when, he had, when they had to clean the floor, everybody lived in one room, size of this, this room. Every whole family. So where would you go? There's nowhere to hide. It was standing on a chair with a gemara. Standing on a chair in the middle of the room that they can map the floor. <laughs> Not like here, the kid has to choose which room to go to rest. <laughs> Will I, I'll be in a purple room. No, no, actually in a pink room. <laughs> he doesn't remember. Why? The material is heroin. It's drugs. It goes into the needle, into the vein. Once, twice, three times, you're done. Your life is over. Finished. No way to come out of it. Same thing money. 
all the show off, all the fancy wedding. Why do you think Hashem gave us such a zets? This corona put all of us on our knees. All these real estate tycoons that own buildings in Manhattan are killing themselves day and night. Nobody pays them rent. They lost tens of millions of dollars. A year ago, when I came to speak over here, some of them would not say hello to you. Why this guy is so nasty? Oh, he owns buildings in Manhattan, $500 million. He's afraid you're going to come to him for tzedakah. <laughs> I will finish with a story, and then I'll give you time. I'm not going to say name. I'm going to change the details because I don't want you to know who I'm talking about. Uh, I actually, when, you know, I speak every Tuesday here in uh, Ora Chaim Shul, in Coney Island, and... Uh, what happened is, one time a Syrian guy came to me from the shiur, he used to come every Tuesday. He said to me, I made you an appointment with a gabai of some billionaire. I said to him, what do you mean? So I want him to help you. He gives money to a lot of places. I like what you do. He'll give you money, you make more CDs, this. I said to him, you know, I don't usually go off to meet people to, for fundraising. That's not what I do. He said to me, don't worry. They have a big fund. He's in charge of it to give. You have to go, I don't remember, it was Wednesday, 9.30. This is the address. It's a confirmed appointment. I said to him, oh, I'm going to be in Brooklyn, 9.30. I live in Muncie. You know the traffic in the morning. I would have to leave at 6 to get here. I came to sleep by my friend here. I have a Syrian friend here in Shane Flatbush. He has a nice attic room. I said to him, I'm coming to sleep by you. Top. Just to make sure, I have not shachrit in the morning, I'll make it on time. I got there, I see a lot of different people came for money. It's not a confirmed appointment, like he said. He said, no, probably I wasted my time. Then around 9.45, the guy showed up. He walks into the room. He said, okay, people start coming. I walked in, he had papers over there. Your name, doesn't know me, he didn't know me. He never saw me before, this guy. Didn't know who I am. He write, I tell him my name, this, that. What are you collecting for? It's, 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 this billionaire nominated him to do the job. He doesn't have time for that. So I tell him what I do, this, that. He's not impressed, Bechla. nothing. Okay, listen, usually we send maximum $1,000 a year, minimum $100. That's it. I said to myself, oh, it cost me more than 100 to come here. <laughs> Even 1000 won't, won't be such a great achievement. So I say to him, did you ever see me before? Do you, my face, you recognize me? I say, no. I say, do you admire this website? that has a lot of Torah there and this and that. So of course, it's a big smile. I said, you know how many rabbis speak over there? So maybe 200. I said, if I'll now show you on the internet that I have more views than them, multiply by 100 and all of them combined, would you give me five minutes of your time? He looked at me, ma? <laughs> what did you say? I said, I'm just gonna show it to you. I'll show you the numbers. I show you their numbers and I show you my numbers. All of them combined. I want to see this. See it. He opened his laptop. I showed him the numbers. You are Chacham? <laughs> Why didn't you say so? I had to see how he changed his attitude. I felt horrible. You don't like to brag about yourself, to come. It's, it's, it's disgusting. I said to myself, I came, wasted my whole day now, supposed to be in Yeshiva. I waited here in Brooklyn for $100. It's a killer. Baruch Hashem, he sent from one account, he sent 5,000. From the other account, he sent 500. That one minute that I opened him the computer, so at least something came out of it. Baruch Hashem, it wasn't a waste of time. But just to show you how people judge the, everything from the outside, I call bluff echad gadol, one big bluff. That's why I'm telling you, don't, judge by names or by nationality or by money, I call shtuyot. You have to check the individual. Some people started with nothing, Hashem brought them up to the top of the world and some people went after the money, Hashem buried them with their husband's money. 
In Hebrew we have an expression. Nishartik kereach mishne atzdadim. I'll explain to you the, the expression if you don't know. You know when someone is bald, some people don't care. Bald, bald, big deal. Some people take it very serious. So they grow a lot of hair on one side and they borrow. <laughs> they lend some side. <laughs> one of them is Netanyahu. Netanyahu, 20 years with the same thing. If you pick up his hair, it's totally bald. But he somehow managed to do it in such a way that he looks like he has hair. Unbelievable. Baruch Hashem. Come over. Come over. Come over? Okay. <laughs> come over. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened, right now you bought from one side, but the other side cover for the bald side. <laughs> what happened if somebody come middle of the night and cut the, the other side and also make it bald? Then you have no way to cover the bluff. That's in Hebrew, it's called Nishati Kereach Mipo Vemipo, meaning I went with a man only because they told me he's rich and I'm going to have great life, and servants, and a mansion, and a nice Lexus. And now after I got married, six months later, he lost all his money, and we have to move to a basement of his uncle, and we have no money, and I don't love him. You pay for what you cook for yourself. Don't do those mistakes, Rabotai. Enough with his ego, enough with the mentality that came to our communities all over. Hashem brings our ego down, don't you see? Don't you see what this corona does to the world? Leaders don't know what they talk about. Doctors don't know what they talk about. Scientists don't know what they talk about. Even rabbis already confused. Even rabbis. Even tzaddikim. There was one tzaddik, he said, I'm afraid of the vaccine. All of a sudden he published the next day, who am I? You should do what Gdolei Ador say. Confused, people confused. Hashem confused us and brought us on our knees. How much more we're going to have to go until everybody will get it and change their lifestyles and change the nature of the, the vacation. When everybody around you is starving and people lost everything they have, even if you got lucky, you own a supermarket. Owners of supermarket was the best year of their life. Why? Everybody sits on the press and eat. <laughs> no, no, no job. They publish the, 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 the annual profit of a super sale in Israel, double their sales. There are hundreds of supermarkets in Israel, double their sales. If they made 20 million dollars, now it became 40. Imagine this, why? All day. Well, People well, eat. Pharmacies too. Pharmacies. And Bitcoin. And Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a bad sign. When Bitcoin goes up, that means that nobody has trust in anything anymore. They want something anonymous to have, similar to gold. Why people went from gold to Bitcoin? Because gold is hard to materialize. Bitcoin, you, you sell it and you get your money finished. People used to buy gold and hide it in a house in the old days. When business was bad, when the economy is crashing, the stock market is a huge balloon. Inflation began now. So much unemployment, so many miserable people, and people still have dreams. Why don't you want her? I want somebody rich to buy me a house. I want this, I want that, I want that. Enough with this. Sometimes everything is perfect. One thing is not, not I don't like the mother. No, so, so, what, so what the mother is a little bit annoying. What else? Everything else is perfect. So he doesn't like the mother. That's a reason not to take your shiduch because you don't like your mother. She knives us. Rabotai, you got the point? Every second is a test. We gotta be strong. The only way to pass the test is to become Bnei Torah and to have emunah. Mi shamay mashkif Hashem lirot ayesh maskil doresh el Hashem. Yei chasdecha Hashem alenu kasher ichal nulach. Your chesed on us, Hashem, is based on how much we count on you. If you count on Hashem and you throw everything at him, what do you worry? It's in the end of Hashem. But you're going to lose everything. That's what Hashem wants. That's what's going to happen. Rav Amrami said, they told him, you're not afraid to get the vaccine? He said, no. He said, but many doctors speak against it. 
It's going to make you paralyzed. You won't have to, to be able to have kids. He's going to cause you this. He's going to do this to you. He said to me, he said to them in audience, even if after I get the vaccine, I'll become paralyzed at the spot, I will still do it. So you're not afraid? Yes, I'll be dancing on a wheelchair. <laughs> Why? Because I did what Gdolei Ador said. Wow. That's it. The rest is not in my head. That's what the Torah says. You must do. You must do it. The rest, don't, I don't care. Don't tell me this doctor said this. He said that. It, I don't want to hear. The biggest Chachamim said to get it. Finish. I do what the Chachamim do. Someone who followed the Chachamim and cancel this ego, Bezrat Hashem will have a lot of beracha. Thank you very much. Any questions before we finish? My app, please download my app, Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi. It's on, it's blue with the star David on the App Store, free, you can get it on, on Google and on uh, Apple. We have all the lectures, Hebrew, English, other languages, every lecture is automatically come to your app. And soon we're going to have live broadcast on the app. We won't do any more Google and Facebook. We don't want to deal with these lefties. It's going to be directly from my app. You have my app, you can watch lectures. You don't have, you can watch. So download it before they will remove it from the store. Like you know, the, the, like Parler and all these lefties. They'll find a reason why to take us off the air. So now, once you have it in your phone, I know that even if they take it off from the App Store, you still have it. Did you know that? I never knew it. I thought that once they take it from the App Store, the app doesn't work. No, that's for the monetization of it. The app will work, but you're not going to be able to download it if you don't have it. So please rush. Any questions? Yeah, right. Please. You're saying always take... The better girl between two girls. Let's say one girl from the community, one girl outside the community. Like outside the community is better than the girl from the community. But truth be told, there's much more sa'ara involved when you go outside. I have a lot of experience in it. When you go outside, you deal with different cultures' mentality, different cultures' parents. Even though sometimes you say this girl from your community is less religious, sometimes you start wondering, maybe it's better, because you could probably convince her to grow versus the girl's very religious, you have to deal with the headache. Or the mentality, you know? You know, when you cannot adjust to someone else's mentality, most of the time the problem is by you. In life, uh, not, not you, I'm talking about the Persians. In life, in life, you have to learn to cancel atani, cancel yourself, cancel your ego, cancel what you used to, and learn to live. Do you know how many couples, Faradim and Ashkenazim, I know? that if you would see them, you would never ever believe that they belong to each other and have wonderful life with great children. Uh -huh. I'm sure they had a lot of difficulties in the first few months of their marriage. I'm sure. Why? That's the way of the world. Also, when a black woman and a white woman, Goyim, get married, they have a lot of difficulties, but some of them are very happy. Also, an Italian goy marry a, an Arab goy or goya, you know, they also have difficulties. Difficulties, it's normal. You learn to live with that. You learn to adjust yourself. You know how many Moroccans lick their fingers when they eat cold gefilte fish? But I never ever believed that they one day put gefilte fish in their mouth. But they marry Ashkenazia or went to Ashkenazim uh, yeshivot. And Baruch Hashem, it worked out. The bottom line is, we have to know it's between staying single forever or pushing ourselves to make some adjustment to get used to someone that is a little bit different. How many American girls say, I don't want Israeli? I'm American, I don't want Israeli. Why not? You know how many thousands of Israeli married to American girls and have a beautiful life? Excluding a whole group to begin with, and not giving a chance is dangerous for only one reason. You don't know what Hashem wrote to you. Mm -hmm. If Hashem wrote to you a girl from that group, from Persian or Bukharian or Yemenite or I don't know what, and you automatically say to the Shadchanim, I don't want this, I don't want that, it's, and I'm not saying it's for, for sure, but it's possible that when Chaz Shalom, a person comes after 100 years, he comes to Hashem to Shammai and says, it's not fair. Well, what's wrong with me? They'll give me a girl. Not some criminal, I was Shomer Shabbat, I was a good person, I'm modest, I'm this, I'm trying not to make scenes. Why didn't give me a girl? What, so many low lowlifes have girls and I don't have? Hashem would say to you, of course I had a girl for you. 
She was ready for you from, from age 22. But you stupid. You did not give a chance. They offered you from this girl and you did not want to go. Why? Because either you're racist or because you, want, you don't want challenges or because you want convenience. Trust me when I tell you, that's not a kosher reason. It's not a kosher reason. People learn to live with each other. I promise you this. All right. It's not the, between the people dating. It's between the parents. You go outside, now the parents are interfering. Right. Once you go on a shiduch and you decide to get married, the parents are secondary. They're not in the same effect like they had before you met someone. When you meet today, I had a case like this. Parents fight with each other, want to kill each other. They have a date for a wedding. And they're already dating for a long, long time. And Shomer Negiya, and they suffer, and they love each other, and they both tzaddikim, the guy and the girl. Mamash perfect shidur. But the parents, both secular from both sides, apparently with horrible ego. And they fight about money and DJ and stupid things like this, and they force them now to cancel the wedding because their ego got hurt. Baruch Hashem, the girls were smart to call me and I hope, it looks like I saved the situation. But imagine she wouldn't call. They would surrender to the pressure. Am I not respecting my parents? What, are you going to destroy your life because your, your mother or father has ego? Like, I don't know who? You're going to destroy your life? You're going to lose your shiduch just because your mother disagreed on the DJ? You understand? <clears throat> so when she told them, I'm going to do what the rabbi told me, they got even angrier. Why? Because they hate Torah. Secular, they don't like Torah. Oh, so you don't have a mind of your own. You don't care about your mother. You're going to do what some rabbi tell you. That's how they look at it. So uh, between me and you, if this is the level of some of the parents, we have to destroy our lives because of the way they are. I told one guy that came from a country that they're Muslim over there. I say to him, you must come out of your Muslim mentality that your parents raised you with. Your parents grew up in a Muslim country, over there the woman is a tissue. <coughs> tissue. You use it to clean, you use it to do things, you throw it, you bring it back. That's how they look at the women in that country. We are Jewish people, we don't care about countries, we don't care about language, we don't care about mentality, and we don't care about customs of some uh, country. We care what the Torah told us. Whether it's Faradi, Ashkenazi, Syria, Lebani, Iraqi, it doesn't matter. We have Torah, and in the Torah it's marriage, it's the same thing. Azab, et aviv, eimu, et avag, bishto. Have to learn, have to support, have to do the right thing. <laughs> If you do what the primitive people bring from their countries, you never have a day of happiness. I'm telling you. If dinner is not ready, of course it's not ready. She works until 5 o'clock in a job. Then she has to go to the supermarket and buy and come home. And it's already it's almost 7. You show up at 7. She still has to, you know, to take care of the house, to have other things. What is this? Your parents in the country where they were, your mother worked until 5 p.m. in an office? No, she was taking care of the sheep and the, and, the, and the roosters in the backyard. She was at home. She had all the time to cook. This is a different world today. You send your wife to work because you have to pay a mortgage to your expensive home and to your car leases. And ah, I cannot make it on your own. You have to go to work. You have to help. And then you demand from her to be a full-time housewife and take care of everything like she's not working. It's not... You have to compromise. You eat a little dinner, no big deal, slice of pizza, end of story. They, you have to learn, you have to learn to let go. Enough with being pedantic, every little thing is an argument, a fight. It's all about ego. Bring the ego to zero, you have no problem. There is no shiduch crisis, there is midot crisis. Mm -hmm. Remember this. People will fix their midot. Everything that bothered them in Shiduchim will vanish <coughs> through the window. <coughs> That's what's going to be. 25 years of experience every day, every hour. Don't you think I learned a little bit something by now? Forget what you were told. This is reality. You can get any girl you want from different places as long as she's a dika, with good midot, with modesty. You learn to live with her. Remember, the Torah says, 
You're gonna like what she cooks, even though in the beginning you would like to vomit, but two months later you're gonna like it because you get used to it. And you're gonna like what she wear, and you're gonna like her smell because to everything in life you get used to. That's what the Torah said. As long as in the beginning you have attraction to her as a woman. If she's disgusting to you, don't ever continue. Why? It's not gonna work. But if you like her as a woman and she's a modest, <coughs> righteous girl, the rest is much, much less important. Remember this, Rabotai. There's a lot of nisyonot. And by the way, there's no shiduch without a fight before. <laughs> like Mara say. There's always going to be a fight. If not the DJ, it's about the rabbi, and who's going to be a sadr kiddushin, Maro Shishiva, is Rosh Shishiva. There has to be fights. That's the way it is. Good things come with struggle. More questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so if you get a shidduk resume, so which questions are good to ask for the person? If it makes sense, that doesn't make sense. Let's say it's outside the community. Out, outside of the community, you have to make sure the girl is at least in your spiritual level and higher, not less. You don't want to go down. You want to bring her up. And you have to see what she's looking for. Some girls looking for Bachur Yeshiva. If you're not Bachur Yeshiva, it's not going to work. Some girls want learning and working. And you have to ask this question. After you go on our first date, first thing you check, you should watch the lecture I gave here last time. You were here last time? Yeah. Okay. You will refresh your memory. First thing you check about a woman, if she's beautiful enough in your eyes. <coughs> Face, body, height, you know, all these things. After that, you begin to see if you have chemistry with her. Most of the things you'll know about Shiduch is only after you date. What people tell you before, half of it won't be correct. And a lot of uh, covering and all kinds of things. Therefore, you will learn after three dates. First date, second, three dates, you will get the picture. You understand? But, again, it also depends on a guy how old he is. For instance, if he's 19, 20, okay, it's no rush. But if he's 40, 35, 40, it's a, different, a little bit different. He cannot be picky. For instance, when he's 20, 21, you want the best family. When you're 40, who cares now about the family? I'm not a little kid to eat by the, by the kitchen, you know? So it's not as critical. So you have to know per case, per guy, per girl. Every guy is different. Every girl is different. But overall, that you like how she looks, that she has very good midot and good ashkafa. Everything else is not so important. Money, family, meaning as long as the family is kosher people. But it doesn't matter. Father is not a Rosh Hashim. Big deal. Father is unemployed. Big deal. The family is poor. Big deal. The parents are not so friendly. Big deal. Even today, she has a brother off the derech. No big deal. I'm not married a brother. I marry her. You understand? But every case is legufo shel inyan. There's no general rule here. I just told you roughly. More questions? Yes. Uh, is it true that uh, if the relationship is too good, the Satan comes and... Uh Find way to ruin the relationship? Of course, not only in Shiduchim. When it's too smooth and good, the Satan goes crazy. Uh -huh. Oh, don't have no fight, no Lashonara, no none. So he's going to try to ruin it. Mm -hmm. Of course, he's going to send some jealous person to say, to instigate. But it's not only in Shiduchim, it's in everything. In everything in life. Yeah, I, I told one guy that is constantly getting sick. He's a special, a very famous athlete worldwide. So I told him, look what's happening to you. Already for over a year, you constantly get injured and this and that. You know why? He said, I don't know. I don't understand what's going on here. I said, I tell you why. Because you're stupid. Every day, interview on this channel, that channel, what business you do, where you invest, you show your wife, you show your daughters, you show what you plan. The whole world is dying from jealousy. Everyone, uh, every other person is starving, doesn't have what to eat. You see, you're making millions, you're investing, you're growing. You have a beautiful wife, beautiful girls. They all say, well, who is this guy? And they begin to go crazy. And you have Ainara for a million people. It's not Ainara of a regular person that has five, six people that are jealous with him. By you, it's millions. So what should I do? I'm a public figure. Never open anything personal in front of people. Don't say what you do, what you make money, you lose money. Don't show your family. Don't put things on social media. 
keep distance from the world. It, yes, it's written that Hashem give you blessing in what's hidden. Be'asamecha. Asamecha means in a barn. Not in a farm where everybody looks. You understand? So you have to know. That's, that's basically, you should know that everything good, the sitra achra, try to wound. Everything. But there's ways to handle it. This is just one example. No, last question. Right. Yeah. The same, but this is transitioning from the same thing. Marketing and hyping. Marketing and hyping is all about promoting what you're trying to sell, a service, a product. At the same time, you're putting on head up because in order to build up what you're doing and get more views and get more followers, you know, you're going to instigate the same thing. It's, it's going to work hand in hand. So what's the comment about this? The Gemara said, the Gemara said someone who sell kankanin. Like, uh, what you said? Spice. Huh? Spice. No, the, 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 that you put tea in it and pour. Kettle. 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 Yeah, kettles. Someone that sells kettles in the old day, they make it from ceramic. They have to put it on the street for everybody to see. Someone like that does not have blessing in his money. Why? Because everyone who passes by on the street, look at these beautiful uh, kettles and say, wow, it's so nice touching, it, you know? So it takes away the blessing. On the other hand, someone that his business is hidden, the wall, nobody really knows detail, has more blessing in life. So you have to do the max to hide your success, not to show that. That's why a lot of people are making mistakes. They buy expensive Mercedes, expensive cars. So what if you're rich? Who say you have to drive the most expensive car? I heard our cars are worth $8 million. $8 million on a car. Do you understand the price of a car? People buy $8 million, $1.8 million on a car, $400,000 on a car. What for? Of course all the problems will begin. You build a mansion, 35,000 square feet, the whole world see your picture, your house everywhere. Of course you're going to have a chas v'shalom aynara, the problem with the children, problem with these, sicknesses, all kinds of other issues. Why? Because you're inviting it. Keep low profile. That's the main advice. Low profile. I know one guy in Monsi. I don't know today how rich he is, but 15 years ago was super wealthy. He had many buildings in England, thousands of apartments paying rent, and he sponsored yeshivot in Israel, him and his brother. And if you see him, you would not even believe that he's a taxi driver. You know, he drives a station wagon, such simple house, one of the most simple house in Monsi. But a family would come from Israel with a kid that has cancer and needs to be treated. He's going to rent for them a house. Nice one, much nicer than him. Pay the whole rent for the year, pay all the airfare, pay the doctors, pay everything for one year, pay the children two days. Everything he will do, but he would live the most simple life. Nobody would believe that this guy is a tycoon. Why? Ben Torah, simple, no show of the house, things broken. Rav Steinemann, you see his house? You never saw in Israel a house like this. The kitchen from seven years ago. Same drawers that you cannot open, there's no wheels. Do you know how many millions of dollars passed through the hands of Rav Steinemann? Hundreds of millions of dollars were in his hand over the years. He never enjoyed it. One time they came to him from an organization. They made a brochure. They wanted rabbis to give them donation that they take a picture and put it in a flyer. Rabbi such and such also donated to us. They came to Rav Steinemann. They said to him, Rabbi, would you be kind to make a small donation, like, I don't know, $100 or whatever it was? that we can take a picture of you giving us the money and we can say that you're also endorsing what we do. He said to him, I cannot do it right now. They went crazy. Wow. This tzaddik doesn't want to give us donation. Probably suspect us. They went, they went, they went home, the press, like, they came a few days later. He sent to call them a few days later. They came back and he gave them a hundred dollars. And they took the camera and they took picture and they put him in a flyer. They asked him, Rabbi, but we were here a few days ago for this. You didn't, you, you didn't give us. What happened? What changed from now to a few days ago? He said, three days ago, I didn't have $100. Baruch Hashem, now I have, so I'm giving you. 
So that means he did not have cash to his name, a hundred dollars to give them. And three days later he had, meaning all the millions that passed through him, he gave all of that to this, to that. It was, no, it was known. 10,000 here, 20, to Yeshivot, 50. Never enjoyed the world. People begged him to buy him places, to buy him homes, to car, telephone. You know the chairs in his house was milk crates. His bed was a milk crate. Milk crates. You know milk crates that you put the milk in it, the plastic? That's how people sit there. Why I did not come to this world to enjoy materialism and to be addicted to the temporary fakeness. If we be 5% of him, you're going to see a major change in your life. I promise you this. 5% from Avsteinema. That's the goal. Let's be 5% down to earth and simple and run away from materialism like he was. You won't recognize your life. I see today every girl, religious girl, that get married. What's the first thing on her mind? Wait. What size the diamond will be? Shem Irachim. Drives me crazy. Can I bring up something? You have to mention it in the shiur because somebody's going to listen and he's dealing with it right now. So I'm not going to say names. We have this crazy custom called the ba'te. The ba'te means the send off to the bride where you give basically... You give basically the, the girl, not only, it's only when you get engaged. You have to give her a nice makeup. You have to give her a She registered in, in a nice store and everything. No, no, you, that's, that's better than what I'm telling you. You have to give her a fur coat, you have to give her makeup, a nice wig. And, who, and whose cost? The boy is barely, whatever he's making. And then the parents go into war, as you know, because now you have to give this procedure. And also, we also have the special flowers, thousand dollar flowers. I don't know where this custom came. So at the end of the day, I told the guy, this is all useless. Just keep it simple and move forward. No, I, I told her that the other side doesn't even have money. So why are you, are you going to negotiate on the Rolex now? She, he, they don't have, the files aren't working. So why in the world are you going back and forth on this? this I don't know what they made it up. No, no. But I think you have to mention something because this is a... I've been, screaming. I've been screaming against all this fancy wedding and thousands of dollars food goes to the garbage by the end of the wedding and all these flowers who goes to the garbage and they burn hundreds of thousands of dollars on show off and not only it's a waste of money and waste of time it also brings Ainara and Chas Shalom can ruin the entire Shiduch so definitely, definitely, I told you, people have to learn to live simple. I'm not asking them to look like homeless and to not change their clothes for a year or, or, not, or you know, <coughs> you look decent, you look okay, you drive a normal car. I'm not asking you to drive a broken car. Drive a normal car, it can be brand new, but it doesn't have to be the best one in the world. Doesn't have to be the prettiest house in the world. Doesn't have to be the biggest diamond in the world. We are not in a competition here. I have huge admiration to some rich people that I know that live the most simple life. Even Goim, Warren Buffett, you heard about him? Ten years ago they made an article about him. I saw the house he lived in and the car, I could not believe it. Simple American car and a regular ranch. Not even a million dollar home. They're one of the richest people in the world. You can buy anything you want. Why? Not materialistic. Don't care about these things. Give, give 17 billion dollars to Tzedakah. Goy. Does he care? Business class, this? No, no, there's not. I get it, I get it, I don't get it. That became the main thing in the life. Because remember, this is poison. Things has to be changed. Sometimes the rabbis in the community, they're afraid to open their mouth because the people either get angry, they don't listen anyway. You, you try to say what you can, you know? If you get on the nerve of the people, they don't want to change. So the more you talk to them and rebuke them, the more angry they get. The more angry they get, they don't want to come to your shul anymore. It's a catch-22. You want them to come because you want to save them, but they come and they don't get saved. So if you're going to go too harsh with them, they run completely. No, it's a no-win situation. You understand what it is? That's what it is, unfortunately. That's it. More. Last question. Yeah. Um, with this virus, there's a lot of people that are losing their jobs. Uh, do you have any of these who could uh, 
If Hashem brought us to such a situation that millions of us losing their jobs, cannot pay rent, cannot pay mortgage, you know, lost their business. I spoke to a doctor last night, he said 90% of my business was gone. 90%, so I can't even pay the, more, the, the rent, the expenses of the office I can't pay. And it's a horrible year. So, first of all, you have to know, when we have good years, we cannot take them for granted. Sometimes they're good years, sometimes they'll be bad years. So if you put a little bit for time of trouble on the side, it's good. Why tomorrow has shown something up and you have some reserve money and it's no lack of fate. It's normal. You're not, uh, you're not uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. We're normal people. Second, the power of crying in Hashem, to Hashem in tears is way and beyond anything you can imagine. The miracles that happens from screaming with a broken heart and desperation, meaning Hashem, I'm in your hand, help me, save me, give me, I need, you'll be shocked at the miracles that can happen. Problem with us that we don't believe in the power of the prayer. If we believe, if now someone will organize for you an appointment with the most generous billionaire that gives to everybody, there's no such thing to send you empty-handed. Would you go? Of course, because you know I'm going to get something and I need it. You can get it from Hashem, you don't need to go to anyone. So it's all, I'm telling you, if Hashem brought us to that situation, what's the expectation? I put you deep, deep in a hole now. You want to get out of there? Begin to scream. The more we are counting on you, the more chesed you give us. That's it, very simple. Many times I tell people there's nothing can be done right now besides praying with tears to Hashem. That's it, Rabbi, that's your advice. They only know what advice I gave them. That's the advice. That's the advice. Sometimes a person is in $10 million debt. If he's going to find a job in some office making 60000 a year, that's going to help him? No. Who can help him now? That's it. Oh, run to here, run to there, try to get a good job. What is it, it going to help him now? Now, I mean, your hand begin to scream all of a sudden. Two, three years later, he can't believe it. He cannot believe the miracles that happened over the years that I saw to people. Against all odds. Why? They put their hands in Hashem's hand. Sometimes I speak to people. The, the email finish me, that's it. For the rest of the day, I'm dead. Wow, what, how these people are going to come out of their situation? Then, you know, they disappear. All of a sudden, four, six months later, you get a nice check from them. They don't have what to eat. You have to call people, help them out, maybe somebody to get them a job. Boom, all of a sudden you get a check. They get very curious. <laughs> a few months ago, they owed so much, they didn't know what to do. How all of a sudden they send a check? So you send a thank you. And you say, I, see, I hope that things is better, Rabbi, you won't believe. And they begin to tell you the miracles that happened to them. Against any possibility you can imagine. It's all in the hands of Hashem. We have person has to know, I'm in the hand of Hashem, and there's nobody else that can help me, Rak Hashem. En od milvado. Rav Chaim Ivoloshin say you have to learn it. And not. some rabbis, when they had moments before they killed them, they go in, they say, what's your last request? A glass of water. Well, a glass of water, we're going to kill you in a minute. That's what you worry about, a glass of water now. So you die thirsty. Who cares now about water before they kill him? It wasn't about the water. It's about holding it and say, Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokein Omech Aram, Shakon Yav Dvaro. That's what happened to me now, it's not him. It's not this goy. It's all shakol niya bidvaro. It's Hashem. I take it. I accept it. I know it's you. I'm not even going to beg him to, to, to have mercy on me. And that's when a miracle happened. Shakol niya. I know I'm in your hand 100%. The Satan that was mekatreg, Hashem said, you see, this is who you want to kill. Someone that not beg for his life because you know it's 100% in my hand. Everything turns around. Remember, everything that we don't get, that means the Satan, the prosecutor, is constantly instigating. 
doesn't deserve it. it doesn't, look what time he wakes up in the morning. Look how he pray. Look how he doesn't watch his eyes. Look how much Lashon Ara. Look how he's jealous with the rich people. Look how he cheat in a business. Look, 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 look. Hashem said, I really want to give him, but there's so many claims against him. But in a moment that you say, Enot Bilvado, it said, I'm 100% in Hashem. I don't sell my, my, my emuna even if you kill me. The whole scale turns around. The Rambam says, sometimes one act equal like a thousand, for good and for bad. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful Shabbat. We'll see you again, Bezrat Hashem, in a while. Baruch Adonai Lo'olam. Amen, amen. We have minyan.